Hi, I am Josh Waldman, and I am the direct response copywriter here at Web Mechanics. Hey, I'm Alex Swope. I'm the SEO SME here at Web Mechanics, and we are snuck in. Taking over Arsham's podcast this week. <laughs> if you can communicate more directly, get at like, how will my product make you feel? Yeah. I think that's going to stick with somebody much longer and put you out ahead of the pack. All right. So we're here to talk about some B2B copywriting. We are. Which is near and dear to my heart because we've got so many B2B clients and yeah. love pumping up their copy. Um, so one thing that I noticed is that B2C, we can all imagine ourselves as a C because we're all, <laughs> we're all, we're all customers at yeah. some level in society. And so we have this feeling of like, oh, that could be fun and friendly and interesting and we kind of know what we want to see and read. But as soon as B2B... It's like it's so flat. It's so yeah. boring. It's like completely unaffected. Yeah, which is so bizarre because I f- I mean businesses are still I don't know. I think we should still have expectations for interesting communications from businesses to other businesses, or like even if it's just an email trip, you should still have some sort of expectation of like this will be pleasant to read. This isn't going to be the most boring thing I see all day. And yeah. I think that's where a lot of people kind of shut down when they have to like write copy for a, a B2B business mm-hmm. is it's always about just getting the message across and being super direct and there's never any room for embellishment. Yeah, I feel like there's like this big push to be super professional, which there's nothing wrong with, but I feel like that often gets translated into stick to the hard facts, Yeah, which often translates into features. Exactly. Versus benefits. Exactly. And I right? think... I think a lot of the time, too, when people try to go with that really professional, direct tone, there's still there are still word choice decisions you can make, even if that's appropriate, even if it's for like a legal client or something that's more along those lines. There's still word choices you can you can partake in to make something feel more casual or even more readable. Yeah. You know, I because I, sometimes I feel like people hinge on trying to sound smart or sound uh-huh. informed or something like that. But I think it makes a lot more sense most of the time to choose the easiest word for the situation you're in. Yeah. And that's a good point. Cause like there's definitely instances where using specific jargon makes sense depending on the audience. Right. right? It's like if you're talking to, you know, a lawyer or a law professional audience, you can use, you know, the parlance of, of right. their actual day to day. But at the same time, you only want to use that where it's like actually going to connect with them and that they recognize it and they say like, okay, you know what you're talking about. Exactly. And then for the rest of it, it should be like, you know, you're at a cocktail party, you're networking, yeah. you're talking to somebody in a professional setting and you're talking to them like a human. Being. Exactly. You know? I also think we have a lot of we have a lot of SaaS clients, a lot of like software yeah, yeah. products that happen, and I think that's in, that in particular in the B two B world is a space where I think there's so much opportunity to write really colorful, interesting copy because yeah. they're always you know co- these companies are a lot of the time talking to product managers or developers or even UX designers, yeah. and I think that you know there's going to be some amount of jargon that they have to use because if you're talking about test cases and things like that you have to actually like dive into Mm -hmm. the vernacular but there's also room to have like a lot of personality especially if it's a sort of like regular checking in email or if it's part of a drip that someone's on as part of a free trial so i think that there's like those instances in particular i feel like there's so much untapped potential there for people to get more fun and more engaging with the language they use yeah and i think that you know just sticking with like sass or some other complicated that's the thing like a lot of b2c things it's like relatively easy to understand right. and grasp. It's like, oh, uh, a pair of shoes. Yeah. Or, oh, um, you know, it gets something complicated like a car. It's like, okay, like miles per gallon, mm-hmm. price point, you know, different kinds of styles. And B2B, usually it's a much more complicated product. Yeah. The, the price point is much higher. And, you know, one of the things that hopefully I think can help, especially like a software a uh, SaaS company or something like that stand out is getting into that um, emotional response, tapping into that yeah. for the audience to differentiate between them and a bunch of other competitors that are offering maybe very similar products. Yeah. But if you can communicate more directly, not the benefits or not the features and like all the specifics uh, on something, but get at like, 
how how will my product make you feel? Yeah, I think that's going to stick with somebody much longer and put you out ahead of the pack. I totally yeah, and and especially again with sort of things that are designed for devs. I'm thinking about one of our clients that's super into that sort of test case development type field. And I think that a lot of the value there comes from exposing pain points and showing you ways that this product can address those. And I think that sometimes that's like that's like the core of so much copywriting, but it always works. It's like getting to that emotional appeal and helping people fill a need, yeah. I think is something that's super important. And another thing that I think, especially with the more involved SaaS products, that's really... I think sometimes gets overlooked when people are writing websites or writing feature pages is breaking down the information in a way that makes sense instead of just mm -hmm. sort of giving you all the information you need in a bunch of super long paragraphs, which I feel like happens a lot, especially with some of the clients who are a little bit older, a little bit more like set in that kind of mm -hmm. way of speaking to their consumer base. I think sometimes even just like sw like swapping paragraphs and figuring out how to present information in a way that makes sense and guide someone through what it's like to use your product mm -hmm. is so valuable in communicating what you do to people better. Yeah. And I mean, it's not exactly copywriting, but I've recently been on a bunch of, uh, you know, B2B SaaS websites and seen videos that are very short, like, <laughs> like um, 40 seconds a mm -hmm. minute. And that's plenty of time for me to like actually see their product in action yeah. and f like understand it at a level that would take me that I couldn't get from paragraphs and paragraphs of information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that I think is a big opportunity for those kinds of companies to say, Hey, maybe instead of paragraphs and paragraphs of information on our, or like, you know, all these, you know, charts of different specs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's put up a video of somebody actually using the software yeah. so that we actually show them, what this could do for them because people connect the dots once you exactly. show them what it does and i think a lot of the times companies are scared to kind of invest that type of time or money into producing <clears throat> sure. a really great video that's really emblematic of what the product does but that same video can be on a features page it can be in a welcome email it can be uh you can link to a white paper there's so many things you can do with the same like 45 to 60 second piece of video content especially for these more complicated SaaS providers, that mm. it's just such a valuable resource you can have. And then you get to basically repurpose it as many ways as you can. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of like resources nowadays that make doing like stock video or like animated video, yeah. like a lot more approachable. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to hire an animator in order to like do a pretty decent looking professional uh, video for like, to like explain a concept. Yeah. And then like screen capture uh, for, you know, especially like a software or something like that. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, obviously the better quality you can get is going to be good. Yeah. But, you know, that it's not necessarily a, as heavy a lift as it would have been like five years ago. Yeah. And I always, like whenever I think of a feature video or a product use case video, I always mm -hmm. think of Monday.com because I feel like it's... Yeah, you're I, really... I, I'm really into Monday.com, but... I really like the way they sell themselves, and I think they, they use sort of like that, you know, that bright animated style that's like kind of in vogue where everything's yeah. big color blocks and things like that. Yeah. They do a lot of that and a lot of really smart feature. They show their features in really smart ways mm -hmm. um, that sort of instantly click if you've ever used a project management software before. And I think that, you know, they know that's their audience. So if they're showing someone how this operates under the schema they already have, uh, and they can sort of show you where it adds value, again, what pain points it addresses. It's it, To me, that's like a home run. And Monday.com, their uh, like YouTube retargeting I know. is like uh, unbelievable. It's intense. I, I, like every time I fire up a YouTube video, they are there. And uh, they not only are using the video to walk you through the actual product, but they start off with this is what it feels like. To yeah. manage your team with Monday.com. And it's like a very emotional, you know, visual thing that has nothing to do with the software itself. Yeah. It's just like, this is how our product is going to make you feel. And they lead with that. And yeah. then they give you like, and here's the actual product. I will also say, I don't know if you've seen any of their out-of-home stuff, but all no. of their out-of-home copy, I think, is really smart. It's mm. very... So I used to live in New York, and when they were running, they would buy whole trains and, and paper their ads all over. Mm. And they would have... They would be really cute, like... Uh, 
way like things that we need to address in New York and it would be like crime bosses check and like mom like moms with drinking oat milk with their kids like still in progress <laughs> and it's just like little cute things like that where that's like really they don't have a lot of space for copy especially because it's such a visual interface but they use what they have mm-hmm. so smartly that mm-hmm. you're like this is a b2b type thing yeah. it's a sauce product and I'm really yeah. interested in it and think it's like pretty quirky and pretty fun yeah and I guess like that's there's definitely a difference between a product. So I think this is the thing. Um, I think you and I have talked about this before, but like marketing a product to somebody that n- that is going to use it versus yeah. somebody that's going to buy it for their team to use or for their company yeah. to use. Different. Totally and, different. And I think that, you know, with Monday.com, the person that's seeing the ad mm-hmm. is someone that's going to be in the software right. using it to project manage um, as opposed to, you know, if Arsham, yeah. you know, is seeing it and he's like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of cool and fun. But yeah. like what, what, what value, what, what value does it provide? Mm-hmm. And like, can I give it to my, you know, my team to actually use it? So, and I think that's another case where, the channel you use to communicate mm-hmm. totally affects how that's getting out because you know that out of home and I've even seen Monday.com ads on like Instagram mm-hmm. and I yeah. feel like those sort of really digital first um, social network forward tactics really play well to all the project managers and people like that but then on the other side of things you know they might be better suited to using LinkedIn if they're trying to get to people who are a little bit higher up the food chain who are actually the ones buying and implementing for a whole team um, and that's something you know I haven't seen it but I'm also not in that I'm not really in that demo, so I'm not right. sure if that if that exists or if it's an opportunity for them. And you know, speaking of somebody like um, Money.com or like SEM Rush or something that's yeah. you know like a especially a SaaS that somebody is going to be in, I see uh, ads for that on Facebook. Me too, and, all the time. And that works for me because that's a product that I actually will be in. Yeah, exactly. You know, as opposed to something I'm going to buy for the company, mm-hmm. and then like I won't have daily interaction with it it makes sense for me to see it in Facebook. And it doesn't yeah. feel out of place. And I think SEM Rush is actually really good. I see those all the time. Yeah. And I mean, there are so many competitive products like in that space. Yeah. But to me, I'm always, SEM Rush is always top of mind because I always see that it's pretty straightforward. All of their ads really do a good job of showing you what the value is and what the service is. Um, and I don't know. I, whenever I think of sort of a search engine marketing thing, I think of them in, first instead of thinking of maybe SpyFu or something else that's yeah. like in that same space. Yeah. Um, and I guess I, there was something that you said a, a while ago that I think uh, you're talking about pain points. Yeah. And I think that this is something that I see a lot in – in general, in marketing, like strategy or marketing uh, copy or like conversion rate optimization is a lot of times like marketing teams and sales teams don't necessarily communicate uh, the the daily interactions with the customers yeah. to get the feedback of, oh, when, when I talk about this, people light up. Mm-hmm. Or when I talk about this, people seem like they're zoning out. Yeah. Or I hear this as a pain point all the time, like besides price, like obviously right. price is always going to be a big thing. But, um, you know, anytime I'm working with a client, usually our point of contact is going to be on the marketing side. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, here's a list of questions I have for your sales team. Yeah. Because a lot of times that's, they're going to have the information that's firsthand from interacting with the client. Yeah. It's going to give us those pain points so that you can take those and, do whatever you need to with the copy or the messaging in order to mitigate the pain points yeah. and address them so that, you know, you are actually positioning against competitors or against, you know, what other people are saying. Yeah. And I think the pain points thing too, you can, there's definitely, there are multiple ways to approach addressing a pain point. I mm-hmm. think you can be a lot more fear-based and you can sort of go for, this is the worst thing in the world. You should be scared of this. You should want to stop this mm-hmm. versus taking a more, empathetic approach which is expressing that you are sort of commiserating with the person you're marketing to and you understand why those things are a problem and why it's important to have them fixed um at a previous job like i i would set up a standing meeting every week with the with a couple of the customer support advisors Mm -hmm. because they're like the they are the most 
involved people with uh, anything that goes wrong yeah. or anything that people see as a failing of the messaging around the product and mm -hmm. sort of getting into that sphere instead of the marketing thing allows you to see how the messaging is actually being received and like what people are getting from what you're telling them because mm -hmm. it might have a totally unintended consequence that's leading to a lot of frustration and a lot of calls to the call center and I think that that's a really good place for writers or really anyone to kind of start rethinking how they're messaging a product. Yeah, definitely. Um, what else? What else? What else? B2B copywriting. Let's see here. I wonder if we have any, any little notes. Oh, yeah. So uh, you said something that I thought was really smart, which is that um, B2B, you don't have have generally as much of that like brand loyalty yeah. that you see in B2C yeah. and that that can totally change how you write about how you, how your communication. Yeah. I mean, I think there are some B2B brands that have, I mean, I'm monday.com monday like, right Salesforce, there. That's you know, one. There are a couple that have really strong brand evangelists right. because either they've been around forever, they have really strong voices um, or they have like a really unique service offering. But for a ton of sort of mid market B2B companies, yeah. it's so much about maintaining positive relationships and not really assuming anything about your audience yeah. because you can't ever really bank on that cachet of sort of brand recognition that someone like MailChimp might have because if you're a smaller provider you have to consistently message new features and you have to consistently drive home why people should choose you over a competitor mm -hmm. and I think that keeping that top of mind is something that kind of gets neglected sometimes which is why you know someone comes to you and they're frustrated with conversion rate or they're frustrated with drop-offs after someone signs up for a trial mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of work that you can do both on the website and in introductory emails and even like display ads for the product I think there's a lot you can do to sort of reframe the work that you're doing and really drive home benefit-driven value adds that that you can sort of glean from this yeah and I think that the consistency in the messaging the consistency in the tone yeah and the brand voice is even more important because that's one of the things that creates that like brand loyalty yeah. for these larger companies it's not I mean on the one hand, it is that they have lots and lots of users. They've been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, they integrate themselves with your business. But they also have a consistency in, okay, that's Salesforce. Exactly. Okay, that's MailChimp. Yeah. And if you don't do that with your own messaging, then all of a sudden, like, you don't have the brand recognition to stand out mm -hmm. and be seen as consistent just yeah. based on your name. So your copy has to work extra hard yeah. in order to remain consistent so that the follow-up emails you're sending, they connect it back to, oh, yeah, I was on that website and I downloaded this white paper. Yeah. And that's right. I, you know, I'm so busy. Exactly. I, I, I looked at it and then, you know, I put it away, but now I'm getting re-engaged with and I connected the dots. Yeah. As opposed to, okay, here's a fragmented piece of messaging. Here's a fragmented piece of messaging. Mm -hmm. And they can't hold together. Right. They yeah. don't They don't make a cohesive anything, really. Uh -huh. And I think that's something that gets neglected a lot of times is, you know, you might run into a marketing person from, again, kind of like a mid-market uh, SaaS product that competes with one of those bigger players in the game. Mm -hmm. And they might be like, why is this successful? Why do they have so much of this? And a lot of the answer is because they have great writers. Yeah. I, I know specifically places like Dropbox and MailChimp and any other sort of big enterprise thing like that, they have whole teams of user experience writers and they have product writers and copy and everything sort of working in concert. And I think that that can sort of, you know, I don't think that should scare anyone away from investing in that type of resource because even if you just put a little bit of different thought into the way you craft your messaging, that can have such an immediate impact on conversion and interest and everything else that I think it's something that a lot of people kind of don't even consider as a piece of the puzzle in, in boosting conversion or boosting sign up or anything like that. Yeah. And I think that B2B, you know, we kind of led with this is that they, you kind of take your take the human element out of it when you start thinking about B2B. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, it seems like there's a lot of like kind of stock phrases yeah. that just kind of come in like, you know, contact sales. Oh, or, yeah. You know, these CTAs that you might see where the, if you, if you were thinking about a B2C audience, it's like, wow, we really have to convince these people the value we're providing or if they're going to pick up the phone mm -hmm. or contact sales. Um, <laughs> but as soon as it's B2B again, it's like, 
oh, our CTAs, you know, they can just say like something very plain Jane. Yeah. Um, but no, you still have to work just as hard. Yeah. Um, in order to message what that benefit is. Like, exactly. Okay. Am I going to just get on the phone with somebody who's going to give me the hard sell mm-hmm. and like waste my time? Am I going to get like a demo walkthrough? Yeah. Is that going to be customized for like what I actually need? Like, are you going to talk to me about what my problems are and then come up with a customized solution? Like what, what is actually going to happen once you get in touch with them? Yeah. Message that, set that expectation because we've seen over and over again, that skyrockets conversion mm-hmm. rate um, for any kind of B2B. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think another thing that people don't necessarily consider all the time is, you know, you're trying to get someone to sign up. You're trying to get that initial conversion. Yeah. I think a lot of time attention drops off right after that. I think people sort of neglect the users or the customers who are already in the pipeline, already using the product. And I think so much of that comes down to maintaining a really uh, appropriate, exciting engagement strategy for people who are already on your product. Mm. So whether that's sending a weekly check-in email to sort of give them their stats or their weekly overview, or it's getting someone excited about a new product launch or a new feature launch. I think Mm. that there's so many opportunities that can really keep people excited about using a product because again, there's not a lot of brand loyalty. So if someone finds a more appealing alternative, there's not really a lot that's stopping them from switching. So I think throughout their lifetime, as a customer, reinforcing the messaging over and over again in ways that are interesting but don't feel annoying or don't feel grating is really important. And so I think that's something people overlook a lot. Yeah, no, totally. Um, so I think that we've covered a lot here. I here. think that we... Mm, oh, yeah. I like, uh, I like this thing you said about don't oversell. Yeah. With B2B. I think that's really funny. Yeah, because I I mean, you can't really, I think it's disingenuous to sell something as like, this is going to transform your life and totally redo your business. And in a lot of cases, it's not going to do that, but it's going to make your day to day easier. And I think it's important to realize that there's just as much value in that as there is in this big transformative thing you're trying to sell. Yeah. It's like everybody's working hard. Everybody's, you know, trying to squeeze some more productivity out of their day. And if your product can help somebody do that and make their life easier and you can communicate that effectively, then that's really the benefit that you need exactly. to lead with. And you don't have to oversell that. Right. You, you just have to show like, hey, look, there's a niche right here where our product does something pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to you know, be a cash machine that you just turn on mm-hmm. and money comes out of the walls, but uh, it is going to do X, Y, or Z. That's just going to make your life a little easier. I think right. that's really what... You know, a B2B audience, that's what they want. You know, exactly. we think about like a B2C audience, it's like, oh, I want to be sexy or I want to be yeah. like, you know, uh, you know, fit and healthy and, you know, or I want to be secure. And all those things, I mean, matter to a B2B person, but I think that ease and convenience yeah. and those kinds of things or, you know, looking good or mm-hmm. performing well yeah. so that you have that job security so that you get the raise so right. that... You do all these other things, um, or just so that you have time to, you know, work on the stuff you want to work on. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, I think that's the kind of stuff that you can really hit home on. Yeah, and you don't have to oversell it. Yeah, we've got a client right now that does. Their line of business is kind of not that glamorous. They do, they do law firm management mm-hmm. platforms, mm-hmm. and it's and that's kind of their whole deal. And that's something that on the surface might seem super like unsexy, mm-hmm. but they have this excellent point that they hit on over and over again about the number of hours they save every yeah. week for people who use their software. And that's the type of thing where they should always be leading with that front and center. Because if if, you, if their firm or a firm that uses this can save eight hours a week, that's such a huge, huge thing that sometimes might get buried in the messaging because they want to talk about their, the things that they think are cool features or what they think could be transformative. But those eight hours a week are in themselves the the selling point and and i've seen and you know to talk about like specifics and language it's like you know you get at that not with just like you'll say about eight hours a week but it's like okay what does that mean for exactly. this person it's more time with family right you know more time uh you know growing your business mm-hmm. if, if that's what it is less time doing like kind of menial paperwork mm-hmm. type stuff and it's like that like it's just taking that like 
benefit like to the next level yeah. to make it emotional, mm-hmm. to make it really tangible for that person. Right. And like that, that concept, that messaging is like, it's like a home that run. makes light and yeah, that's, that's light and night and day. Yeah. And again, you look at, you look at the people who are actually getting the marketing for this and mm-hmm. it's, and it's, you know, they're lawyers and they're running their own law firm, which they, you know, don't really know how to do that well. And if you think they're tired, they're working insane hours every week. They have yeah. so much on their plate already. Sort of bringing this as a, like, here's how we can help you a little bit. So you can spend time doing what you enjoy doing. Yeah. You can spend more time on cases. You can spend more time with your family. Sort of diving into what the what the average person who's going to see the most benefit out of this is like, yeah. I think is a really good place to ground the copy you write yeah. in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, ah, awesome. Josh, this is always a pleasure. I know, it's fun. Talking with you. I think... Uh, I think we've kind of covered a lot of this. I mean, there's a lot more that we can say. That's I, true. I think, you know, we've got a blog post coming out about some more of these details. Yeah. So people should definitely check that out if this was interesting at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll be back. Definitely. If, if Arsham lets us, lets us take <laughs> it over again. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I guess for now, we'll cool. sign off here. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, thank you.